This is the Hidden Killers podcast with Tony Bruschi. Featuring author, psychologist, and daily contributor, Siobhan Scott. Siobhan, let's talk about Ruby Frank and Jody Hildebrand for a bit. I have to say Shades of Daybell. Oh, you one, know? 110%. Man, the Ruby Frank with the attention-seeking, the very curated, blonde, attractive appearance, mm-hmm. the superficial charm, but grandiose. 100%. And, and these kids could have been killed. I mean, this is horrifying. It brings tears to my eyes listening to what these kids have been going through. It, and just another really odd case coming out of the Mormon faith. Yes, that was not lost on me whatsoever when I heard that, because I'm almost making a tally over here in the studio this yeah. year of how many LDS cases are coming to light of parents or significant others doing horrible things to horrible another, things. another one another. Yeah. And I don't necessarily know if this is, you know, necessarily tied to the Mormon faith or if that kind of gives some sort of credence to the parenting style that that she was exhibiting. Mm -hmm. A lot of people just looked at her on her online forum that she had there on YouTube, the two and a half million people that subscribed to her. Some hated her, some loved her for her parenting style. I guess Mm -hmm. what we saw on the surface, one would describe it as kind of old school, how a lot of us adults who are over, you know, 35 have been raised. Mm -hmm. And uh, not really shocking on some of the things of, oh, your child forgot their lunch. Well, Maybe don't bring it to them. And then next time or forever, they will remember it. That didn't seem to be like cruel and unusual, weird punishment or starving a child. Only now, if that had been a 12 year old, I would Mm -hmm. agree with that. But a six year old, I mean, clearly her sense of, yeah, what a say, I mean, worlds of difference developmentally between a six year old and a 12 year old, even a 10 year old. I can say, okay, I can see the rationale there. But six years old, they're not tracking their daily schedule. You know, they're not thinking that way. And she did come off. And I've just seen video clips, of course. I never followed her channel. I've Mm -hmm. never heard of her before this. But very pious and holier than thou and strict. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it just made my skin crawl listening to the way she would film herself castigating the children and lecturing the children. Just really creepy and weird. It went beyond just being strict. That That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Or trying to teach a lesson through some sort of, you know, negative, you know, behavior or some sort of negative action. But it was always just kind of on the cusp. It was, I I, would look at that and I, a lot of, it's like, I don't think this is really, you know, you're going to be arrested for any of this, but it was always kind of on that line. Then what we are now learning is that it did go far beyond that line off camera. Uh, How I guess how does someone have these double lives like this and and is this going to is this more common than we think of individuals very heavy on social media very into their appearance that they're masking the more they mask online the better they look online the more grandiose mm-hmm. they appear online does that equate to the more dark and sinister home that they are going back to and holding with their children I sure think it can be. You know, it's the mark of a very scary personality disorder, this drive to appear so perfect and have all this media attention and then hiding this very dark side. I think her niece is giving interviews now. And mm-hmm. apparently this hooking up with this Jody Hildebrand, who's a, a, I would call her a would-be therapist, but more of a cult leader mm-hmm. who really has some sadistic qualities. And then they started what they were calling, I guess, a business together. Mm -hmm. but it looks a lot more to me like a cult, you know, counseling agency, but the counseling was really focused on, oddly enough, preventing masturbation and sexuality being dangerous. A lot of talk about managing darkness and deception, you know, this is just really hallmarks of some really scary stuff. Mm -hmm. And sort of like with Chad and Lori Daybell, when you put nutty people together, it just sort of amplifies and Mm -hmm. intensifies. And I think that's what we're seeing. It just seems like in Utah, particularly in the LDS faith, there's a lot of people vulnerable to nonsense that are easily influenced and clearly layers of secrets and dangerous behavior and child abuse going on that's hidden. Very much so. And we just keep seeing it over and over with individuals in that faith for whatever reason. Yeah. And, and I'm not here to say that it's a bad faith. I'm, I'm saying it's right. uh, the behavior. I, I don't care what your faith is. If, if somehow right. 
this is producing this type of individual in mass out of it. Right. It's something to be looked at. And maybe some of yes. those ways and teachings need to be adjusted for not having this sort of output of nutty individuals and nutty being put very lightly. There were subtle signs about this, but there was also very obvious signs. Her oldest daughter, who's 20 in college, tweeting out or, or putting on social media right after her mother was arrested, the word finally in a picture of her mm -hmm. in the police car. Mm -hmm. She says that she's been trying to report this for years and has mm -hmm. not had any sort of luck. Uh, can you speak to that at all? We hear this. It's, just, it's, it's the common story all the time of we've been trying to get help. We've been trying to mm -hmm. get help. And it's not in any way to, to bash CPS. They don't have resources. They have right. a lot of great people that are putting up with horrible things every day, trying to do the right thing. But again, resources. Is this another example of that system just being an utter failure because it's not funded or staffed the way it should be to truly yeah, protect kids? Yeah, that's certainly possible. I'm not familiar with their local resources there, but that, you know, it seems like CPS is sort of the last priority of the government everywhere as mm -hmm. far as funding. And it also could be because just like Lori Daybell was such a good actress when talking to police, you know, and can put on this mask of normalcy. It could be that when she was spoken to by police or CPS that she was just a master manipulator. So you mm -hmm. combine those two factors. They don't have time to look real closely and investigate real deeply, yeah. but they look superficially and the person glows, you mm -hmm. know, they look great. And I mean, the her husband is a professor of, what is it, engineering mm -hmm. at the university. You know, these people look good. They do. Um, and so you really have to probably be Sherlock Holmes and look pretty closely to go under the surface and see what was really going on. And there's a certain skill set that's involved with that. And it's certainly the same skill set that works with someone being able to run a social media channel and have one image and then on the other mm -hmm. side be a monster mm -hmm. if these allegations exactly. are true. What's your take on the husband who is through his attorney has now stated that, well, he had no idea the abuse was going on. She was with Jody all summer and the kids were there. So he wasn't present for it. But again, this, I don't think this thing sort of happens in a vacuum where suddenly no. Ruby and Jody got together and she started duct taping her kids. Like it's a new idea. Right. I, I do have to wonder what sort of situation the husband was in, in this being complicit, being a, also a victim of the abuse of the wife, but not standing up as an adult and doing anything. What's your take from, I guess the little that we know thus far. Yeah, it would be hard for me to, to frame an adult man who's a college professor of engineering as a victim. He clearly is an intelligent person and he's a well-resourced person and he's got money. So I would never use the word victim for him. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I understand why his attorney is saying that, right? They're trying to paint a, a, a better picture of him than probably what most of us would have right now. Mm -hmm. But I would guess that he's extremely passive mm -hmm. and left most of the decisions as far as how the home was run and how the children were reared. He left it up to her mm -hmm. and probably just, you know, looked the other direction if there were things that might make most of us squirm and didn't pay a lot of close attention and maybe went along with the story that we've got this model family and she's a wonderful mother and all is well. And it was just easier for him to deny what was really going on. On. So at this point, it may be somewhat shocking to him because the blinders are off, mm -hmm. you know, so he may feel like a victim right now, but I don't think I could describe him as one. Uh, and that's an interesting thing to look at, because when you're in those sort of situations and your partner is behaving in abusive ways, uh, whether it be to you directly or sometimes to the children, if it's normal quote unquote behavior or common behavior, I think would be the right word in the home, a, a pattern of behavior. You may not necessarily think it's wrong or, or, or you may exactly. not have a, a red flag go up until you're out of that environment. And somebody's like, yeah, parents, we don't do that sort of thing, especially right. if it's all, you know, I'm not trying if to stick. all, you know, no, I'm mm -hmm. not trying to stick up for him in any way. I, he, there, there should be consequences for this. I would think if he was just standing by letting mom duct tape the kids or whatever the hell mm -hmm. is going on there. Mm -hmm. Does he hold accountability if he was that guy and like, well, mom can do whatever she wants and you just look the other way. 
Yeah, he certainly, I think, holds some moral accountability for letting it go on. Apparently, if he was not there at the time some of this stuff happened, there may not be any legal consequences for him. Mm -hmm. But certainly morally, I think he's got some responsibility. And it could also be that he was raised in an extremely strict home as well. Mm -hmm. And so this, you know, where many of us would say, whoa, this is off. Those alarm bells just weren't going off for him. Mm -hmm. It probably happens quite a bit where, well, this is how my parents did it. I turned out okay. I still love them. And then, uh, yeah, it gets to be a very gray area. And then you have someone that's off and they push it even further. You you don't know. It's like the lobster boiling almost where mm-hmm. they don't know it until it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. And it definitely, this went to such an extreme degree. It's just, it really does, you know, just shake me hearing what these poor kids were going through and, sure. and seeing that this could have progressed to something where one of them was killed. Yeah. Yeah. It's fortunate that it didn't go that far, but I don't think we were far from it. You're locked into the Hidden Killers podcast. Want more? Start binging on all of our true crime podcasts right now through Apple Podcasts and get an ad-free experience when you sign up to be a True Crime Today Premium Plus member exclusively on Apple Podcasts. More of the Hidden Killers podcast dropping soon. Press subscribe now.